This video is about doing business internationally, how you can deal with different cultures, how you can develop your organization, the challenges and the opportunities. So welcome to Profile 3 TV and we're coming from the Innovation Factory here in Springfield Road. And today I'm joined by Robert Conlon, who is the Head of Executive Development at Euromoney. So Robert, uh, do you mind telling us a little bit of, uh, more about yourself? Um, yeah, so I work in Euromoney, which is a, a global FTSE 250 company. Mm -hmm. um, I work in the learning part of Euromoney um, and we provide training mainly to financial institutions and banks in I think it's 130 countries um, around the world. I, don't, I haven't been to all of them, I have to be honest. Um, and I look after all the management development and sales training globally for the business. Incredible. So uh, I know there's going to be a lot of stories to, to mm, tell us yeah. today. And we're going to focus on international business development. Yep. And again, as Northern Ireland, and I appreciate yes. you coming in and sharing your knowledge yep. with us today and the, and the viewers are very yep. important because for Northern Ireland, mm. uh, international trade mm. and exporting is yep. so, so, so yep. important. So thank you for coming Welcome. in and, and sharing your, your knowledge. So you, you've actually dealt with many countries around the world. Yeah, I, I, I've got two ways of counting them. It's 49 countries, you count Jersey, the Isle of Man and Guernsey, um, but, and Gibraltar, but it's 45 countries uh, around the world that I've been to. Incredible. Yeah. So if we jump straight in, and one thing uh, you did mention is mm. Middle East. Yes. So yes. I've had some, I've had pleasure of living in the yeah, Middle yeah, East, yeah, uh, yeah, Dubai yeah. and Egypt for yeah. eight or nine years. Yeah. Incredible yeah. location. Yeah. And if you've been there and lived yeah. there or yeah. travelled there, you yeah. understand the culture. But as a business, mm. uh, trying to uh, develop your, your company yep. into the market, yep. what, what, what's it like? I think, I think probably the key thing about the Middle East is there's a lot of commonality between the countries, but there's a huge amount of difference as well. Um, so if you're a Northern Irish business and you're going to Dubai, it's a completely different experience than a Northern Irish business going to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Because Dubai is a, you know, as you know yourself, Dubai is a big expat, global hub. You're very unlikely most of the time to actually deal with a, an Emirati national um, when you're doing business there. So I think if you're, if you're going to expand into Dubai, um, you probably can trust your normal international instincts and, and business cultures around the world because that norms to a global business culture. It's when you start to meet the different other parts of the Middle East where um, Businesses in Northern Ireland may need to think about how they adapt to those business cultures and how they work within them. Wow. So the Middle East is a, a different area in its own, mm -hmm. and then every single country out there, yeah, again, a, a yeah. different difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you said you, Kieran, you were in Egypt, mm -hmm. and um, you know the Egyptians, you know, are, are are in many ways very, very different to, for example, the Saudis. There's there's there's, there's a lot of you know, similarities, but there's a lot of difference. Um, also, you've got, in sense of culturally, you've got somewhere like Saudi Arabia, which is generally a lot more conservative culturally. So, if you arrive, let's say you're going to set up an office in Dubai, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to send people from Belfast to Dubai. Well, they're not going to deal with huge amounts of challenges. There are some. You, 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 you're I've adapted to the local environment because they're probably going to live with lots of people from Ireland, the UK, anyway. Um, but if you have to go and set up an office in Jeddah or Riyadh, it's a completely different, not just from the regulation and from the business you're doing and, and how you do it, but also if you're going to put expats out there, they're going to have to live in a very, very different environment. So I think you know it's about looking at each country and really understanding that marketplace. Excellent. Well, thank you. I couldn't resist jumping in and talking about the Middle East. Yeah. And I think we've got everyone's attention now. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, let's jump back to yeah. your own money and your, yeah. your current job. So mm -hmm. again, uh, I, I actually, been honest, until yeah. I found your profile on yeah. LinkedIn, I yeah. didn't actually know yeah. about the business. And I would yeah. like to think I'm pretty savvy yeah, online. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, you guys have a, a mm. big company and do a lot of uh, things online. Do you mind sharing what, yep. what exactly you do? All right, so it's a, it's a financial information business. It's most famous for a magazine called Euromoney Magazine. But under that, it has like four, you know, many, many different micro businesses. Some of them are price prediction uh, organizations. So, uh, for example, we've got a division called Fast Markets, and that helps set the price of, of metal, for example, or steel around the world, um, because it would allow you for price discovery, so a company would understand that. So we've got all these different information businesses cloaked under this brand of Euro money. Um, and we've got three main bases, New York, Hong Kong, and London. Yes. As an online business? It's 
It's increasingly a digital business, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, but we still have uh, conferences, training all around the world. But increasingly, how people get to those conferences is through the, through the internet, you know, through the website. Amazing. So everyone's going digital. Yeah, yeah but absolutely. The world is absolutely. getting smaller. Yeah, yeah. And how? So you're in Belfast today. Don't yes. You? So <laughs> you, yeah. you, how, how have you ended up here? You're yeah, it's a long story. <laughs> it's a long story. I, so I, I, I moved to Belfast 12 years ago. So my parents are originally from the southwest of Ireland. Um, I was brought up in London as you can hear from the accent um, and f when I started to travel um, my wife is from south of Dublin and um, when I started to travel we thought we wanted to be closer to family because my mum and dad had retired to Ireland many years ago um, and my, my wife's parents were here so we wanted to be closer but in terms of tax and everything I, I couldn't I needed a UK tax code and all this mm -hmm. sort of stuff and that's when we discovered Belfast I hadn't, I hadn't really been here before you need to sell Belfast for <laughs> exactly. that. yeah yeah there's a, a secret there yeah well you see I think what people don't realize that you, you, you hear a you know of course the, the, the I think it's less and less I mean yeah. traveling around the world nowadays the first thing people talk to you about is Rory McIlroy and Game of Thrones. Yeah. You don't hear the troubles oh, anymore. You know, yeah, yeah. Twelve yeah. years ago, that would have been the main conversation mm -hmm. starter. And so, increasingly, that's the whole difference that Northern Ireland's gone through. But twelve years ago, it was still a place that we hadn't explored. And then suddenly, we realised is that when it comes to quality of life, um, it's a really good place to be. You know, um, so we like the fact that we can be near the sea, all the things you can't do in London, and the fact you can actually get places quickly. Which is really good. Um, so yeah. So though I I'm, I'm, I don't do any physical work in Northern Ireland, I'm either in the office in London or I'm flying around the world. Um, but this is where I work from. Amazing, yeah. excellent. So you can get anywhere in Northern Ireland as long as it's not in the West. Like exactly. Right. Yeah, 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 that's what problem. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I appreciate what you're mm. saying because um, when we lived abroad and came home, yeah. uh, I actually hadn't seen a fraction of the North, and I've spent the last two yeah. years yeah. travelling Northern Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. I'm blown away yeah. 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 by all the things I didn't know no, exist no. and are on our doorsteps. The yes, experiences yes. and places yeah, 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 incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think that's one of the key things about it. Like from the North Coast to the Mourne Mountains. Mm it's a relatively short distance and you're getting from the Atlantic to the Irish Sea, you know, so it's really quite an amazing sort of journey, yeah. yeah. Especially knowing that you travel around the world, yeah. see, you've seen it all at yeah, this stage, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so amazing. So, yeah. so we've talked about the Middle East, yeah. so, and, and we're, that's, uh, and again, thank you for coming and sharing your no uh, expertise in this. So yeah. the Middle East is a, a probably a growing market for companies mm. and businesses mm. here in Ireland, I yeah. can imagine for food yeah. and uh, uh, exporting loads of different things, mm. software and everything else. Obviously, big other big markets would be America yes, and yes. China mm -hmm. uh, again. And normally, when I think of China, we're we're taking goods in. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, someone mentioned to me yesterday about actually exporting out to China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. how big Game of Thrones yeah, and things yeah. like this is yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah. And obviously, as you say, Game yeah. of Thrones everywhere in the world. Yes. So if we were to talk about America and then talk about yeah, China, okay. do you mind? Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, all right, so to the USA, that's not an unusual place for most businesses in this part of the world to understand the culture is not incredibly different, um, business ways and, and the way things are doing. It's relatively easy for a company here to do business in the USA. Plus it's quick, you know, it's the closest part of Europe, you know, essentially to the USA. Um, problem is in the USA, everyone's doing business. So you really need to understand what differentiates you. There's no virgin territory, you know. It's like it's a bit like you take a, a postcode of London, like EC2, and you take, let's say, a part of Manhattan. Everybody's hitting it, you know. Yeah, that's the problem, you know. So you go into an incredibly, it's there's lots of business there, but you go into a crowded marketplace. So I think it's you know you you got to go niche in that that marketplace because if you you got to find your niche. Um, um, and you've got to find that kind of micro sector because you can't just go out there and, and hit everywhere and, and you've got to go regional in many ways. Um, you know, when, when you're looking, if you're going to set up a sales team going out to the States. But it, it's definitely niche, um, that in my view. Mm -hmm. um, even as out of our business, you know, uh, when we're into the US, we take a sector of foreign banks based in New York. Um, that we target. And we've got other relationships with big US companies, but those big US companies are getting hit all the time. Wow. So I would say in the States, it's about what's your niche um, and how can you connect to that niche audience? And that generally you can grow from there. Amazing. So obviously uh, we do all the yeah. states out there, yeah. so, but every state is different. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And uh, as an Irish mm. company going mm. out, do you think mm. we're still mm. uh, in a good position to leverage I think, I think it's huge. I mean, when I, I, I do lots of work over in like somewhere like Chicago and, you know, and everyone's got an Irish surname and there is that totally massive connection um, still there and plus the Irish are liked mm. 
you know, there was a really kind of nice kind of atmosphere and welcoming. I, I know it, it is a bit corny and, and, and you, you, yeah, you do get the, I've seen a lot of conference calls in American businesses and when they're doing a conference call and you'll hear the American guy and he'll sort of say to everyone in Dublin, are you all in the pub and then everyone will, you know, you know it's a bit patronising. But that gives a kind of nice rapport build if it's used positively. And so I think there's massively goodwill. I don't think you can assume though, once you're outside those kind of real big Irish areas like Boston, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, I, once you were hitting some of the others, the mid Midwest and Texas and places like that, then it's gonna be, and also then you're gonna have a lot of immigration into the States. Yeah. So you can't, what, what I would say is like, you can't ride that too much. No. It's quite a nice conversation starter, but it's not a sustainable business proposition. No, gotcha. So don't uh, yeah, yeah. bank on the yeah, Irish yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, open yeah, the door, yeah, but yeah, won't. Yeah. Yeah. It's still so basically you need to be thinking niche, thinking mm. of who you're targeting, yeah. and uh, and every state is different. And yes, 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 yes. Very, very clear. And then go on the other oh, side. Right, if yeah. we go to Asia, yeah, then yeah. again, and, and normally goods. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I anyway, mean, you say China, everything's coming, even yeah. the tourists. Yes, yes. Oh yeah, my yeah, word, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was, uh, so one of the banks I work with uh, reasonably closely is HSBC and they're huge in China and so I've done a lot of work with them, with them in China and they, they were on LinkedIn yesterday I thought it was really interesting they were saying that now you have to move from a made in China strategy to a made for China strategy um, yeah so you, you so you know what you've got now is it's, it's totally changing China I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if you've, you've been Kieran but like if you go I, Shanghai is the most incredible city in the world I mean have you seen you mega structures there? Like, that, you know, you now look. If you go to somewhere like Canary Wharf, that's tiny compared to what you see in Shanghai. You know, it's, it's just amazing, and their technology is just incredible nowadays. You know, for example, they've all got these little um, computer tracking devices, and you put your finger on the, the taxi as it drives past, and the taxi gets a bing and it comes to you. And so the technology is going so fast. Um, and so, so, so they're moving from a, a you know a lower skilled factory based production, cheap based production to a massive middle class who are all buying Range Rovers and you know um, cars. So it's two things. Number one, it, it, if you're in the luxury goods market or the freight, see this is one thing that could work here. They, there's a real problem in China with the food supply. Huge problem. Right. Um, you can't trust. A lot of the food that you're eating. And they, uh, baby, yeah. The baby milk. Scandal. Yes, the baby milk scandal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was huge. Um, so so, New Zealand food, Australian food is huge there. If you go into the supermarkets, you see New Zealand flag, Australian flag, Canadian flag, US flag, and so you know there's a huge market for like fresh produce or things that can be guaranteed that are are good. So I think especially for you know this part of the world, that's a real forte. Wow. Yeah, you know, um, in there. So I think. Um, in China, what they're looking for, they're looking for brand, they're looking for authority, um, they're looking for that this has got a heritage. I mean, it's really important. They love buying that stuff, um, you know, and when and they'll pay for it. So in, in many ways, I think it's probably easier to just... The challenge you've, you've got in China is, is once you're outside those global centers or outside Shanghai, to be honest, it's you need generally someone who understands Chinese culture. You need a, a Chinese person on yeah. the ground to help you. Um, but I think China is massive, massively. Uh, it's very hard to get in, but once you get in, it can be huge. Incredible, yeah. and I, I can't believe you, you're telling me something I've never heard of before. Mm. It's mm. made for China. Yeah. So thank yeah. you for yeah. sharing that. It's incredible. Mm. Talk about a mindset yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. how things have changed. Yes, it's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. And the, and China as a as a destination. So I haven't been sadly yeah. 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 But yeah. on my list. Yeah, so it's one day. Yeah. So uh, that's that's incredible. And the food and drink industry mm. here in Ireland. Oh my word! It's, it's what we're. Yeah, 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 yeah. Honestly, it's it's, uh, it's like for example, like you know, it, it, there's loads of there's loads of Irish pubs now in Beijing, you know, and you wouldn't believe it, and, and, and people are drinking Guinness. So and it's just a simple one, but that's because the brand, brand is so important, the heritage, the history, and, and th that gets bought, and then people pay for it. So if if someone really wanted to mm. approach or go and look at the Chinese yeah. market, what, what would you suggest? Is there, is well, I think so, it's always good, to, if you're a small business, to go for someone like Invest NI and get one of those of business trips yeah. and those sort of stuff, because I, yeah, yeah. I think that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, Generally, getting a local partner can be really important because you've got to navigate a lot of internal regulations and laws. Um, you you should there's a lot of agents that can help you that are based in Hong Kong, um, and um, who can help you to expand into China. And that's they make that a speciality. Um, there, there, you know, 
let's be quite clear here, there are serious, still barriers operating in China because the legal system is so different. Um, so you need to make sure that contracts, you need to get advice, are, are contra and there's loads of reasons, for example, do you try up your contract in Hong Kong, which a lot of people would do, and that, that sort of stuff. And so I think, still think you need to get good local advice, but I, I think some, a, a local investment agency can help you with all of that type of advice. But it is important, there is risk. There's a big difference between operating in Hong Kong and China. Yeah, I mean, it's, they call it one country, two systems, and, and, and it is two systems still. And if you're maybe jumping into the Chinese market for the first time, you probably want to go through Hong Kong. That's where most people do it, you know, because it, you set up in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is so easy to set up a business. It's really good law of contract, really you know, easy way to rent or, or put properties um, there. So your ease of doing business, I think it's number two in the world for doing business, Hong Kong. Very free, very easy, um, people in the government speak English, all that sort of stuff. So it actually can be a good bridgehead mm -hmm. to get into Chinese. But I will say this, the biggest problem uh, for UK based companies is they have got lazy operating through Hong Kong and they do all their business and they've lost out on a lot of opportunity in mainland China because it's just too easy to sell into Hong Kong. Um, and that can be a challenge. So Germany, for example, would sell a lot more to China than the UK would um, because Germans weren't lazy. You know, they, they, they flew into those Chinese cities, um, which most of us haven't even heard of, and they got in there and they did business there. Um, well, most of the people, the UK-based businesses, tended just to go to Hong Kong. So I would say, yes, Hong Kong is a really good way of getting yourself started there, and it's probably a low-risk, you know, easier way to do it. But long-term, you don't want to just sit in Hong Kong and do business. You need to get out to the mainland. You need to get out to China itself. Build the relationships yourself. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, Not get just in Hong Kong. Yeah, very good advice. So yeah. we've talked about, obviously, the, the main regions, uh, yeah, I yeah. guess, actually, in Europe. Um, Future, if, if someone, yeah. where's breaking, or is there where's places breaking? that's hot, or is it, is it countries within those regions? It's the, yeah, it's really interesting, aren't they? Um, I, I was, I still think China, I mean, I went to a city called Wuhan um, there back in March, and their, their airport's like as big as Heathrow, you know, and I've never even heard of the city um, before. And there is still, now it depends whether you trust that the Chinese economy is going to continue to grow and there's not going to be challenges there. A lot of people said that it's going to run out of steam one day. But there is still so much opportunity. And the problem is, is, is um, I think it's loads of opportunity in the retail market. That's where there's huge opportunity in China because you've still got places that they're just building new malls all the time and there's just new, new things like that happening. Construction. Um, so there's the, I still see China as a you know huge opportunity if you can, and it's, but it's still hard to navigate. This is quite clear here. You know, you it takes time. Businesses find it difficult to expand in China, and you still need local you know partners um, and building trusted relationships can be done. So there's still a huge opportunity there. Um, you would there is then if you go down to Southeast Asia, if you go down to like Vietnam, um, which people don't often realise, um, Vietnam is is still amazingly poor, but huge amounts of money in it now, you know, um, huge amounts of business coming out of Vietnam. Um, Indonesia, I mean, these places have their instability and they have their challenges, but you know, Indonesia, again, is this huge amount of people living in this country and there's, there's still economic growth there. So I would still say, personally, Asia is, is still, for me, one of the fastest growing um, regions in the world and, and, and somewhere that you still lots of business coming from. Incredible. And I've been a wee bit selfish mm. and looking at yeah. Asia because actually one of our biggest clients, uh, mm. we do a lot of video work for them, and they have us translating their videos into Chinese yep. subtitles at the moment, and yep. they want us to market them in, yep. in China. And actually uh, a Chinese company seen some of our content, reached mm. out, yep. and it's out in China getting subtitles added to it yep. right now, yep. and yep. Uh, we so, see that uh, same yep. as exactly what you're saying. And so what's also happening, the other phenomenon you're seeing in China is these, these large technology companies, which were doing a lot of kind of outsourcing for people like Apple and you know and all those stories, they're now what they're now outbounding from China. So you know they're coming out of China, and they're setting up. So you're now starting to see this new idea of, of Chinese businesses going abroad and setting up different operations around the world. And that's a whole new thing. We've not seen that out with investment by Chinese companies, which means is why they're reaching out to you and why there's new opportunities there. So I you know when you've got such a huge country. 
you know, it's and as that that country is going through this huge, whole economic growth cycle in a matter of 20, 30 years, it's, it's, I would increasingly think that if you're a business based here in Northern Ireland and you're a digital business or you're look you you've you've got a global presence, you're increasingly going to find there's going to be someone clicking on your website and it's going to be ordering something that's going to end up in China. Um, that's just going to happen. And also, the Chinese are doing this Belt and Road uh, initiative. Um, so their idea is uh, what they want to do is they because it used to be the Silk Road that came out of China. Um, so they're building this massive road out of China. So they could you could so the first train came from London from China recently, um, and they just want to start sending trains and cut and you can drive. They want to drive from China lorries into Europe. Yep, yeah, that's that's their kind of plan. So so you. You're, you're still seeing huge amounts of opportunity. And now there is, again, I always put it down there, there is risk because it's, people often worry about the Chinese economy and where the money's coming from and going to. But there is, I still think there's huge opportunities. And, and look, being honest, there's risks everywhere. What yep. do you do? You have to yep. take some risk. Yes, yes. Haggle risk. Risk. Yep, yep. I've been watching what the Chinese government have been doing in Africa hmm. and how they're going in and funding companies and development there. And yeah, yeah. It's incredible yeah, back yeah, to what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, so, what they're doing around the world. Yeah, yeah. So um, you would, I mean, I, I work with the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund um, and I mean, they've now got investments all over the world. Um, they, I mean, Heathrow Airport, Thames Water, they would all be invested in by, by the Chinese. So, yeah. Paying up everything. Eh? <laughs> so back the way. That's it. Eh? But uh, no, very very interesting. So no, thank you for taking us yeah, on the yeah, whistle yeah. top tour yeah. tour around the world. That was uh, very interesting. If we jump back to the training then, yeah, and yeah. what you what you do yeah. day to day. So yeah. you're actually training executives, and that's yeah. what your yeah. program does. So what, yeah. what? How do you even? Yeah. How do you even start training people yeah. at that high level? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I think that's a great question. I think um, one of the problems. So where I would normally come in and where I would train people is there have been, so we've got different types of training in our business. We would have graduate training. So we would run um, courses for big global banks and we would manage their graduate programs. So we would, we would look after that. Um, most of where I, I get involved in is professionals who have probably been at least 10 to 15 years into what they're doing. And, and generally what you find is at that point, and a lot, a lot of time in banking, is they're at a point where they now have to front the bank, you know, they're the face of the bank in front of the client. Whereas before they started off as an analyst, they were a part of a project team, but now they're the person who sits in the room and has to present um, to their client. And often the, they've not, they've really overdone the skills of analytical and number crunching, but they have to kind of relearn that kind of in the client and working with the client skills. Um, and also what you find is, uh, especially in banking, but I think it's the same in lots of places, you, you get a lot of really, really smart people. Yeah. And because they're very smart, they go faster than their client, um, which means that we have to teach that. So the key thing I teach is being right doesn't mean that you're influential, um, that you can be correct, but if you don't work at the speed of your client and your client doesn't come to the same conclusion as you at the end, then being right just means that great, but you haven't actually been able to give this client a solution. So, and that's, and that's where we always, so we work a lot on those kind of presentation skills for these kind of more senior bankers, selling skills, um, and how you create value with clients. Um, one of our most interesting courses is that we, um, we teach people how to manage global clients. So for one particularly large global bank, uh, we work with their client service managers, and they would be managing like a, we would run simulations on, on um, a payment failure in Rio de Janeiro and how it impacts a team in Hong Kong and then how it impacts a team in Seattle. And you would just do this kind of round the clock, sort of follow the sun thing. So yeah, it's all very interesting and, and quite a lot of fun. Mm, yeah. and, and you know what's really interesting is that you're, you're ex describing a lot of problems and mm, challenges mm, that mm, these mm. executives who are at the top of their game yep, in international, yep, global, yep, 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 yep. FTSE companies, yep, yep. but they're actually very similar to yep. problems that Yep. companies have at yeah, yeah, yeah. all levels yeah. even starting absolutely you're talking I, about the same skills I, I would say that an entrepreneur is off, is obviously very passionate about their um their what they can do and how they do it but doesn't always understand how they communicate that and how they kind of model that and how they um brand it um so there's a lot of research actually on people when they're presenting to venture capitalists um and um, what works and what doesn't work um, and they, they, they face the same problem because what you often will get is you'll get an introvert who has got a fantastic business idea who then has to stand in front of like six people or whatever and then has to show they're really passionate and amazing. Problem is, if you're an introvert, that's horrible. 
you know, that, that's terrible. And, and two things happen. You either go monotone and it's, there's no passion, there's nothing there, or you overdo it, you start becoming too enthusiastic and too passionate. But either way, you don't get credibility. Um, so it's actually been found that the two things that go wrong when people are trying to raise funds is either not being passionate or being too passionate um, because it doesn't seem believable. Um, and so what one of the things I work with people, especially with those more introverted analytical individuals, is how you can create something that's credible but at the same time is, is enthusiastic and communicates. But it's got to be credible. It's got to be real. If it's just you trying to be happy clappy, it's not going to work. And I think, I think small business owners face exactly the same problem because they have to do this even though they might have a very technical product or solution that they're managing. But it's very different to knowing that works to convincing others. Amazing. And you talked about it standing in front of VCs there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Or bank managers yeah. when you're looking for finance. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. It's not, it's not it's easy. It's not easy. And it's all the same skills. It's all the same skills um, that you have to use. And, and, and yeah, so it's trying to encapsulate. So I, I think the key thing in, in what you're trying to do in that type of training is you're trying to help people encapsulate value. Um, and everyone talks about their elevator pitch and, you know, mm -hmm. the fact is you've got to get it into, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the idea, um, I, was I was talking to someone recently and um, when Ridley Scott went to pitch Alien, um, he was there with all the money guys and one of the money guys, you know, said to him, he says, um, all right, tell me what this film's about in three words. And he just went, um, Jaws in space. And he got the money. <laughs> <Straight away. laughs> um, but, and, and that's amazing because you know he, he was able to encapsulate that whole idea into three words, you know. And I think sometimes that's where people really struggle with: how do you encapsulate all of your passion, all of your ideas, all of your thinking, and you get it into something that's meaningful in a couple of minutes? And that's really where you have to work on. Wow, three yeah. words. That's, I got this, three words tough. That's yeah, tough. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm gonna yeah. be practicing that one. Yeah. Soon, right? So <laughs> yeah. three words, three words. Uh, so very good. Uh, so how how do you deliver your training? Is it is it remote? Is it online? Yeah, face to face. So, or so we have we have three ways we do it. So one way um, is traditional face to face, um, and that's and that's where you so you would either have an instructor fly out to one of these clients or you know where they are and you bring group people together together um, or we have public courses where people arrive into London or New York or, and they come from all over the world so that's that's the face-to-face -face element or what we have is an online and social learning element um, so the online is, is through webinars um, where you would have someone bringing people together particularly for global teams and the social learning what you use is you use a you know, social learning platform to help people to do peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and facilitate that. Wow, peer-to-peer -peer yeah. learning, yeah. so yeah. people help each other? Yes, yes, and that's the idea. So the idea would be that long-term, what the what you would do is you make the learning more sustainable. I mean, it may involve still face-to-face -face contact, but then when people go back they can then start to kind of, you know, talk about some of those learning they've done, some of the problems they're facing and how they solve it. Incredible. And do you find any of those methods is superior to, to the other or is it a mix? I think it's really about where you are as, a, as an organisation, um, you know, and, and what you want to achieve. Um, you know, if you want um, an emotional connection, if you want people in the room, um, you know, presenting and getting very involved, then yeah, you're going to want people to come together and come together as a team. Um, if though what you're looking for is taking um, real world problems and you want you don't want people to go into a classroom, obviously the social route, especially for we hear it all the time, millennials and you know that sort of stuff, is going to be a very, very powerful route. So I think it is it's about what is your objective and then you can create and to be honest, what's probably best is a mixture. You know, a blended learning approach which takes all of those areas put them together and gives you that kind of like you know, holistic journey. Very good, very interesting. And and even again, I'm referring back. Mm. I'm just uh, amazed that people at such a top level. I never even thought that yeah. they would be constantly mm. being trained. Would mm. is it? Would you see training as a once a year, or is it a continuous investment, yeah. or once every couple of years? I think it's continuous investment. Mm -hmm. um, I think once you get to like very senior levels, it almost becomes coaching because you get very few people into the room, you know, and you're not really going out there and saying, look, this is how to do it. <laughs> they kick you out of the room very quickly if you did. Um, <laughs> you, you, you're, you're trying to say, okay, this is what you do, how can we refine it? So, um, so you, 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 that's sort of how we do it. But I think it's, you know, you've got the learning is a process that you do all the time and it's a process mm -hmm. you do with others all the time. Um, when you want to go to a kind of formal um, learning process, it's generally because you've got a problem you need to solve. 
Um, but yes, organisations need to have ongoing learning uh, facilitation in there. But generally where I would come in is, is generally an organisation comes to me and says, you know, Robert, we've got this challenge. Um, how do you think we can solve it? And then you create the solution. Um, and that's how you develop wow. the training and develop the answer. Wow, amazing. And so again, I'm thinking big companies, small companies, mm -hmm. tra so training and mm -hmm. investing in training is, mm -hmm. is critical then to, to yeah. grow. And yeah. So you, you, you passionately believe that training and development is, is yeah. core to any business? Yeah, I think, I think there's a, a guy called Chris Agrigus and he, he wrote a book on organisational learning many years ago. And, and the key thing is a, a, an organisation, learning is adaptation. Um, so, so if your organisation is not learning, that, but the market's changing, at one point you become not fitted to the marketplace because you haven't adapted. So, so what I think businesses need to think is that training is one aspect of learning in their organisation, but this is where maybe a social media platform comes in. An organisation needs to think about how does it capture what we call the tacit learning. And the tacit learning is, it, it, even like your business here, Karen, is the tacit learning is if you've got one of your colleagues or one of the people you employ and they're working on a project and they get to know that project and they solve a problem on that project, mm -hmm. but somehow that methodology is not shared with everyone else in your organisation, then you don't have an organisational learning. You, what you've got, you've got one individual, but if that individual goes sick, goes, leaves yeah. the company, they take all of that learning with them. So a real challenge for any business is how do you share and how do you create tacit learning to more formal methodology so that everyone can understand, oh, that's how you fix that problem. And then the organisation learns and it's not just an individual learning. That is a big challenge mm. because mm. You, you're trying to run the business. Yeah, yeah. You, you, and, and especially, it's really interesting you've mm. mentioned the tech space because mm. tech or online, even yeah. on, like even we think of retailers like yep. you know the, the transformation has happened mm. in the industries yep. with the internet and digital yeah, 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 yeah. and the Asian market yeah, you know, yeah. what's happening in the world yeah. things are changing so fast now mm. it's uh, incredible that um, I, I can't imagine someone learning something and then taking time out to train the whole team but yeah. it's something we're really looking at because actually I, I would agree the, the more skills everyone has mm. uh, the better the team will be but how you do it we need you to come in and help us well there you go um, um, yeah and it's, it's how you capture that and, and, and mm. how you can how you can make sure because the problem is is that generally what we say is, is we say that businesses get caught in the kind of so busy doing yes that generally the reflection part suffers. You know, you, no one sits around and thinks, all right, well, how did we do that? How did we, could we do it better? And, and that is not much time for that. So, so the problem about that is that, is, as you say, individuals learn at different rates, but the organization doesn't share that learning, doesn't capture it, and that's probably really important for any business. Very good. And yeah. we capture, at the end of every project, we capture mm. Mm. Uh, good. learnings, good and bad, okay. but we don't share it. Okay. So there's an okay. opportunity there. So thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a no good. Yeah. That's a very yeah, good yeah, yeah. Uh, tip for us yeah. there. So and I'm sure uh, to, to everyone else. Yeah. So we've talked about the high level executives, yeah, 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 business yeah. leaders. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What about the uh, employees? And how yeah. how would you train employees? Or what would you recommend? Or what have you seen? Well, I I, I think. It, it, again, it depends what you it, you need your employees to do um, at, a, at a basic level. Uh, but I think every business needs consistency. Even as, see, it, the problem is, it's easier to have consistency in small business. Um, and as you expand, that's the difficulty. How do you create that consistency? Because if I'm running a small, I don't know, uh, a small shop. I can be there and I can be constantly supervising, I can constantly kind of help people to be consistent. But if now I've got now six shops, how do you help that consistency? And that's where you probably do need to start looking at your internal um, induction, training, all, all of those sorts of areas. So even if we take away the higher order questions, just the, the fact of how do you make sure a business culture is consistent here? Um, and that's where a business then needs to start thinking maybe more formally about how it trains its employees. Amazing. And mm. it's like you're, you're, you're talking me through my path because, yep, yep. again, as we've grown, uh, mm. you've got such a personal relationship with all your team members yes, yep. and you can invest time with yep, them. Yep. And actually, this year now, I've probably spent less time with mm. our team. Yeah. Uh, very frustrating. Yep, yep, so yep, I want yep, to spend yep, time yep, with them, but yep. actually, just you, you there's another layer there yep, now. Yep, 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 yep. Um, but it, it's incredible, yep. but you need to spend the time. Yes. So uh, we're, we're probably cheating a wee bit or being mm -hmm. creative we use uh, I use a lot of video training so I, I recorded the video last night on SEO 20 yeah. minute video and shared it with six people on right. the team yeah upskilling all six at yeah. once yeah, 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 uh, yeah. something uh, that I found online yeah. and um, an opportunity for us yeah. and our clients but um, it is a challenge I guess yes, it is it is, a challenge. It is, it is. so we're, we're, we're talking about 
learning mm. and leadership yep. and management and training. Yeah. Uh, question I, I've always mm-hmm. wondered: uh, Are leaders uh, going off topic? Now, yeah. you probably see where I'm going. Are leaders born, or can you create yeah. leaders? Yeah, that. I mean, that's always been the kind of you know sixty million dollar question. You know, yeah, yeah. We're but, gonna answer it today. Yeah, we're gonna answer it today. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the answer straight away. Um, I, look, I would I would say there's probably two things. What you do is you have a certain group of individuals in the world who are enormously charismatic, um, and those people probably are born. Okay, you know, and I, but they do some training as well. Okay, so just give you a very quick example. Let's take a Bill Clinton. Okay, now, did Bill Clinton go through lots of communication courses and management courses to get like that? No, he didn't. I think he was probably always, I think probably going to Oxford and all this sort of stuff. All, of course, it all helped. But let's say you even take Love Him or Hate Him, Boris Johnson. These are a kind of a bullion, charismatic people who, who have, wherever they go in their life, they've been leads. But if you need to staff your your government, your industry with those characters, and there's downsides to those characters, <laughs> they're well known flaws uh, for those old characters, you're not going to get enough people. You know, do you know what I mean? If you're relying on, on that charisma, but then if you take on the other side, somebody like Angela Merkel or even Theresa May, lover hater, mm-hmm. um, these are people who have had to do, they've had to learn. You know, they, and that's probably the majority, the vast majority of people out there. So you get these very special individuals, and there's probably a lot of, but the way you were brought up, all of that sort of happen. But as a business, you can't rely upon that, can you? You can't rely upon that. You've got ten people coming in to manage your business. You can't rely upon that. They're all going to have a consistent leadership style. There, and they, then there's technical aspects to leadership. Um, a charismatic person may be terrible at giving feedback, and uh, maybe awful at managing their time. You know, it might be really because they're so they're so you know the special one like Mourinho. You know, be, you know the way they treat others might be absolutely not with your ethics as a business. So so you know, yes, there are some absolutely. I believe that some leaders probably would lead in almost every situation they they are in their lives. But as a business, that type of leader, that char- charisma, is not necessarily what you want or what you need in your business. What you need is you need consistency and you need the te- technical aspects of leadership to, to be understood. Um, so if you're running a business, you want to make sure that when there is a difficult conversation, for example, in the business, it's handled in a way that you know has regard for the other person, has regard for the, the organization's mission and vision. So I would say if it's... There's a big philosophical debate everyone can have, but the reality is as a business owner, you, you need to make sure that you've got consistency and the technical aspects of leadership covered off of your team. Amazing. Mm-hmm. So we can train, basically we can train yeah. some skills yeah, 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 and yeah, we yeah, can yeah. train yeah, yeah, yeah. leaders yeah, and develop absolutely. them. And, and I don't know if you're going to become, I think there's, as I said, go back to it, I think what training does when it comes to leadership and what I've been involved in mm-hmm. is I think what it does, it gives people models. Does it... M- there's a there's a different part of leadership, and I see where you're going here. And I, <laughs> there is an interpersonal and emotional side to leadership, and which is very much based upon the person. And I'm not sure how much training can move that dial. Mm-hmm. I think your own personal life experiences move that dial a lot more than me coming in and giving you training. Where I can move the dial in a very kind of le- less way is help you structure that difficult conversation, um, help you manage a you know a disruptive behavior in your team that's the technical aspects but there's a yes i totally agree there's an emotional aspect to leadership and i just i don't know if training goes there yeah, you know, that's yeah. uh, incredible mm. as you say question that mm. we ever know the answer yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, <laughs> so, yeah yeah so but again back to teams and so mm. training because companies are investing a lot in training mm-hmm. and, and things are moving so fast mm. uh, so training can create a, an amazing hard-working team then if you do it right yeah, I think I think you can do you can do it two ways. I think um, it, it, the key thing is though, if you're going to get the training right for your business, you've got to make sure that the, the company you're deploying or using is a understands and is a good fit for your people and a good fit for your culture. Um, if you bring in the wrong wrong person, let's say so for example, um, and this is a very interesting one. So many years ago, I so when I first started in training, like you know, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, whatever. Okay. Um, I would have been training in you know local government and you know that that sort of stuff and councils and that sort of stuff. You you got to be a completely different person to when you walk into a you know big bank in Tokyo or something. You know they they're different fits. And if you get the wrong conversation and you break, you don't get the rapport at the different areas, then people will just reject the knowledge. So I just think the first key thing is, it, do I have a real world problem that I can validate? 
do I do I let the people know why they're going on that course and is and I can show them that there is a path here to help you do something better. The worst type of training though is when it's imposed. You know, it, it, that training in my experience never works when you know you get ten people and they are told that you've got to go on this course and they don't see they, and they almost see this course is a really it's a soft way of telling them they're not doing their job. Um, but you haven't got you know the whatever to come and tell me that. And that, that's, you can, the trainer can help break that down, but you've not created, in fact, we know that some of the, for example, um, unconscious bias training or inclusion training that has occurred in some UK government organizations has actually made some of that stuff worse because people, when they walked into the course, they became very defensive, they didn't know why they were there, they thought they were being reprimanded. So in fact, it made people very defensive against it. So I think you've got to make sure you've got that buy-in and that people see why they're doing it. And if they do, and they're open, then you've got to get the right fit and the person you're deploying to do it. You know. But first, the worst thing in the world is just sending a memo on nine o'clock training, you know, Tuesday morning, you don't know why you're there. Mm -hmm. Then you just, it, 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 there's no point doing it, you shouldn't be sending that person on it. Well, and what type of training do individuals have to, or should do, to mm. become more effective in selling B2B? Okay, yeah. Um, I think there's a lot, I think, you see, so what you've got in the only business development cycle, you've got everything from um, the hunting phase, to use a horrible kind of corny <laughs> term, you've got the hunting phase at the start, um, and it depends where your business is and where your salespeople are, mm -hmm. because if you're in the, kind, if you've got a very immature sales cycle, and you are simply, you don't have the leads, and yes, you've got your marketing going out there, but you need also on the to get bigger deals. You need some relationship mm -hmm. stuff, and, and once you're actually meeting people, you kind of move from marketing to selling anyway. You know, because marketing should be bringing in those leads, and then you're moving into the relationship phase. So there, I mean, you could actually you can just identify so many issues there. Everything from how do you manage the first impression? You know, how do you manage meetings? Uh, how do you manage your schedule? Uh, how, you know, they, 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 there is, you know, how do you, how do you, do you, one of the biggest things people hate is networking events. You know, you walk in there, someone puts a big felt tip pen on your, your side, um, and then you're supposed to walk around, you've got a glass of wine in one hand, and you've got a plate of cheese in the other hand. You can't even shake hands, it's ridiculous. But you know, some people hate those events. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 because yeah, the, the, the conversations are so tense and difficult and, and what you end up doing is finding the one person you know in the room and talking to them for 45 minutes um, because it's safe. Um, and, and, and people, even when they have those conversations, they don't know how to exit them. Because you know when you do meet the first one person in the room and suddenly the conversation's really good, well, it gets boring after about six minutes and you need to go. Yeah. <laughs> and you need to get the meeting and have the business. So, so even at just that level, there is, you can unpack that hugely. You know, that, that's huge. And so then you move on to, okay, now we've done all of that, now we're actually in the room with the client um, and we're at the diagnostic phase, you know, where we're actually sitting down and we're trying to diagnose what's the issue here, what's the problem. And you've got everything from how you do your value, your, your elevator pitch, or what I call your credibility pitch in the first two minutes, um, how you then move into your questioning phase. Most people don't question for long enough. Um, and most people don't know how to ask a, uh, a deeper probing question from the first question they've received. Um, and they, too often what happens, and there's a lot of research on this, is essentially what happens is people ask questions at the start of a meeting, like, so, you know, so how many people do you employ? And the individual replies, I employ 400 people. Okay, well, with 400 people, you have a real need for communication solutions. Oh, terrible. You've already closing on a terrible question. Um, there's no need there. You've assumed the need, and we call that an implicit need. And we know that if you close on that, your closing rate just goes through the floor. Um, and so we, we, and we know if you actually ask too many of these, how long you've been in business, where are you, we, we, the research tells us that that questioning tends to reduce and the closing. So there's, there's, there's lots of other stuff on that. There's, there's a very f famous idea of what system one, system two, that you know the, the problem for the expert, which is for example will be you coming to sell to me, mm -hmm. is that you process at a speed of subconscious. Because I don't know what you're talking about, I, I process at the speed of conscious, mm -hmm. which means that you get quicker to a solution. Well, I don't even see the problem. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and if you go to solution because you can see the problem, you've seen it, 
um, you tell me this is what you need to do. And it's very frustrating for the salesperson because you've got the right answer, but I, I'm not in the space. I, I'm, I'm not in that decision making arena. And by you doing that, I, am, I will probably say, I will probably actually not say no, I'll just go, thank you, send me a proposal. Um, and what you end up getting is you get very little disruption. Well, what we know is it, people get it wrong. They think, people think the diagnostic is for the salesperson. Can I find out your problem? Often experienced, um, and I wouldn't just say salespeople, if, if experienced people in their line of business, they know the problem. You know, when you get in there two minutes into that meeting, I start saying to you, well, look, I've got this problem on a website. You already know the solution. Okay, You know how to redirect this. The problem is I don't really understand the problem. You go for quick to solution, I'm at what we call implicit need or whatever, I'm not, I'm not at that problem where isn't. We, we don't go anywhere, we're not disrupted. So the diagnostic is actually for the client. Going through the process of diagnostic, actually going through that process, is a very, very powerful way of me coming to my decision. And the problem is too many people don't understand that diagnosis is not for you, it's for them. And that's really the kind of key or the magic we, we talk about, and that's, that's what we concentrate on. Um, and that's at that very high level of selling. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Um, and then, yeah, then you've got the, the next part, which is how do you get a second meeting? You know, this is one of the biggest problems for most salespeople is they have wonderful first meetings. And it's, I always call it it's the first day. You know, you know, oh, it was lovely. We must see each other again. It was wonderful. <laughs> she never calls me. She never takes my name. Uh, she's never in. You know, and, 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 and you don't get the second meeting. Okay, and, and in fact, I, I, I've seen it time and time again, if my first meeting goes too well and there's all this romance in the air and we're all talking about how we need to work together, I often find that never proceeds. And you don't know why, because you come back into the office and you tell everyone, I had this most amazing, amazing meeting today. So the skill of trying to create follow-up is you can spend so long just working on that. So this is what I'm saying, you can unpack a, a relationship management cycle and you can focus on every little part you know, to, put to the point of cross-selling, to the point of upselling, all of those sorts of areas. But, but yeah, so I would say that it depends where you are in your sales cycle. It depends where you're, so and it's very easy to see, do we have lots of prospects they never close? Right, then your issue is not marketing, because you're getting leads. Um, your issue though, is that once they're in the pipeline, for some reason, you're not disrupting them. Okay, so, or we've got long lead times. You know, this is taking like six months to close these deals. Um, you know, and, and or we have, we now have lots, we have a very mature cycle where we, we actually, there's very few prospects out there because we've spoken to everyone. But we have this massive customer base, um, but we're not creating, we're not getting them to rebuy or to upsell. So it, it, so what I would say, and it's been a very long answer here, and so I apologize, but um, what I would say, it depends where your business is in, and then you target that type of sales training dependent upon where your challenge lies in your business. Wow. Does that, sorry, I went no, there. That was I, a I've been blown one. away, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, amazing. So yeah. I have learned a lot there, okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> there incredible. You yeah. you, you'll have to get out of here today, <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem now. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about sales teams, and, and mm -hmm. thank you for going into this, because mm -hmm. actually selling for any business yeah, yeah. is incredibly hard, I don't care. <laughs> so what, what are the key skills you a salesperson or sales team should have? Um, I suppose I, I, I put onto the, t the person and then I, maybe I'll go onto the team because I think there is, there's key aspects there. Um, I mean, all, all the evidence says that there was a, I think it was booked by Stephen Pinker a few years ago and he talks about the ABC and there's a very famous film called Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross, where Alex Baldwin says, always be closing. Yeah. Well, he, he talks about attunement. Okay, so attunement. So a salesperson needs to be able to tune in. Okay, and I, I, I think that is massively important, you know, in the sense of, um, so I've got to go in two weeks' time to Tokyo to stand up in front of 13 Japanese senior bankers and present a solution. Now, you, it's going to be, I'm going to be jet lagged, I'm going to be in a city I've never been in, I'm going to be dealing with all this stuff going on, um, probably I'll have just phoned my wife before she went to bed and it probably wasn't the best conversation in the world. Um, now you see all of that happens and that, that changes everything about how you're, can you tune in or are you somewhere else? You know, can you actually really focus in that room? Can you really focus on your audience? Can you really focus on your message? Are you, are you nervous about the outcome? And because you're nervous about the outcome, you're thinking the end state, you're not thinking of being in the room. 
Okay, because you're, you're, you're so stressed about, God, if I, if I lose this, if I lose this, this is gonna be terrible. Or you're so stressed that you start to become self-conscious. God, is my tie right? And how are they looking at me? And this guy's not looking at me very well. And I've got this guy over here not looking at me at all. Unfortunately, what will happen is your non-verbals will collapse. In fact, we know the non-verbals will become, they'll become so corrupted that you'll actually look like you're lying. Um, we know that you know what will happen to you is that you may even start to find uh, word finding difficult um, because you're so over here somewhere that you're so so like for example the worst thing in the world happens to you where you get this thought of how am I sounding everyone's looking at me now those things will collapse your presentation that's where word finding become difficult because you'll suddenly become caught in the headlights a little bit um, so you've got to be able to go in there and tune in and tune on in that audience. And you, you know, I remember it was, it was a, a guy many years ago, a, a very senior Irish businessman once said to me, you know, he talked to me, he, he ran for a technology company, their global supply chain. And um, he was going to Singapore and uh, he said to me, you know, I'm going to meet, uh, there's 400 people there, right? He, he had 7,000 people in his operation. And he says, you know, I've got to remember for every one of those, the moment they meet me, they're not going to forget it because he's the big boss coming in from Ireland and he, you know, I've got it. And I've got to remember, but for me, I'm going to meet 40, 50 of them during the day. He says, I'm going to be you know, thinking about my plane that night. I'm going to be thinking about actually my stomach's not feeling good because of this. the food's not agreeing with me, all of this stuff. But he says, for those four minutes, I've got to totally emotionally engage, like absolutely on them. Okay, because I won't see them for the next year and I need them to remember me and I need them to, to, to think I gave them presents and I gave them time. Um, so that emotional engagement, he, he always said to me, and by the end of the evening of doing that, he would go back to the hotel, his brain would be dead and he would have nothing left, you know, and he would just lie on his bed just looking up at the ceiling. Um, so I do think that attunement, emotional engagement is very important, how you tune in, how you step up for those presentations. Um, so, and how, you how can you read the people in front of you? That's really important. So I often say you've got to quickly read informality or formality. Um, you know, if you walk into the environment, it's all smiles, everyone's sort of sitting around, it's all open, there's some sandwiches in the middle, people are bringing their coffee cups in, and then you go informal and there's more humour and there's more fun. But you always have to prepare for those environments where you walk into the room and there is a load of people in suits just staring at you. And you've, you've got, and that's probably one of the things I found toughest when I first started um, selling you know, internationally, because I'm a generally quite informal person. And then you got to move to informality. So I think that reading of informality and formality in the room is one of the first things you've got to be scanning in that first 60 seconds. You know, all right, I've got to go formal here, which is less humor, more analytical, more numbers. Yeah, and th that's very important. So that's what so he's in tune with. Just to go through the, the next one is buoyancy. Um, so buoyancy is how you come back from defeat. You know, um, so you know uh, how, how you deal with defeat. Now I've got low buoyancy. I've had to work on it all my life. If I lose a deal, I, I'm decimated, you know. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I should never be in sales, um, um, and so yeah. So you've got to have that buoyancy. Um, you, obviously, too much buoyancy, you're a psychopath. You know, you're, 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 you're nothing ever is going wrong in your life. You know, but too little buoyancy. So that's too little buoyancy. But so the big thing is, and it's really interesting. See, if people have low buoyancy, unfortunately, they have too much empathy in selling, which sounds awful because you see, in selling, you have to negotiate. And if your client turns around and goes, your price is really high. Too much empathy means you'll give you'll give way. Okay, so you've got to have that pushback, you know, on, on, especially when it comes to price negotiation. And finally, uh, this guy Stephen Pinker talks about clarity, the ability to be very clear, succinct, and to the point. And that's what he says are the key things of salespeople. Um, and I probably would agree. I think it is tuning in, um, buoyancy, yeah, clarity. It's called the ABC. ABC. Yeah, yeah, so there ABC. is an ABC. There is an ABC, but it's a different what? ABC. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as I say, so much information. Mm. What what advice would you give to a company that's thinking of setting up global mm. businesses mm. or global mm. selling this? I, I, again, I, you know, I, I haven't had a huge amount of experience with it, but Invest and I seems to be a really helpful and useful organisation. And there seems to be a huge focus here on, on that kind of global expansion. So I think there's lots of people to help. Mm. I, I, I kind of the key thing I would say to people if you're it's really interesting I've, and I've seen this lots of so, so I a number of years ago I had I, I had a one company and it was in the, the west of Ireland and 
they had a huge operation there, and but the senior manager there wanted them to um, deal with the Americans, okay? Because you see, what would happen in the conference call? The guys in Ireland would be a lot quieter than the American guys, because you know, you, you, natural thing Americans would boom down the conference call line, that sort of stuff. And it was really interesting because I was I was teaching that, and I, what two things I realised is number one, you've got to be you. You can't get yourself lost and not be you. So. You know, be you from where you're from. So if you're from, you know, County Down, you be from County Down, because there is <laughs> there's that famous take: you better be you because everyone else is taken. <laughs> okay, so I think it's really important. Don't try. And I've seen some people do this: they create Mid Atlantic accents, and you know, they to try and fit in and that sort of stuff. Okay, so you got to be you because that's your brand. So I think it's really important, however you brand that, however you brand it as Irish, Northern Irish, whatever, okay, you brand it or county down or whatever you do, that's your brand, very important to be you and in, in the individual you are. But you've got to be adaptable on a global scale, okay? So you've got to sometimes tone down the parts of you that don't translate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, so if you do go to Japan, you've got to be able, you know, you can't start talking about, you know, lots of, you know, if football teams that you follow or stuff like that if they don't understand it. So, and I mean, you've, you've lived abroad, so you've seen that. So it's important because people love to know, oh, this is Kieran, where Kieran's from, and it's a great brand, it's got a conversation starter, but it's it's about um, how you adapt that. So it, it's one, somebody, this, 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 uh, business editor once said to me, it's important to be you, but to be adaptable on a global scale. So I would say, be your brand, be from where you are, but then think, how do we adapt that? Does that, does that make sense? Perfect. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. And my last question, okay. because I've stolen so much of your time. Okay, no what, what do you think are the, the main challenges that business leaders face today or might face in the future in, in trying to expand? Um, yeah, I, I listen, you, there's no point in me talking about Brexit because no one understands. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so that, that's... Can we talk about that in two years? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, 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 we, we, and I, then there may be opportunities from that. There may be um, not zero, no opportunities. So I, there's no point yeah, me, me talking about that. Uh, the major challenge is seeking to... Exp Actually, I think they're less and less. This is a world that has become easier and easier to trade in. I mean, even though, again, I'm not going to get into political issues because I don't think I'm qualified enough to talk about it because of the whole Trump stuff as well. Mm. But in reality is, is that, you know, it, I suppose it comes home, you can now fly from Perth to London in one flight. You know, so you can go from Australia now to London. It's a 17-hour flight. Now, let's be honest, 17 hour, hours of economy, it's going to kill anyone. But, you know, what, what, what I'm kind of saying is, is that you can now do business, and, and flights are relatively cheaper than they used to be and that, that sort of stuff. Mm. But you can do business now a lot easier. So I, when I, when you ask me challenges, I say it's, it's just opportunity. And also if you're on the, it's hard now to be a website. Let's say if, you've, and if you're fronting and you're using a web presence to front, which most organizations are today, you're, to, you're gonna get people calling in from all over the world. It's, it, it, it's almost kind of think it's, I, in 10 years time, I wonder how many businesses there will be in Northern Ireland that are just doing business in Northern Ireland. I say it's going to be very few, yeah. unless it's obviously if you're a retail local, local, shop or yeah. stuff like that, it's, it, it's different. Yeah. Because you know, you've been telling me about the traffic that's coming through your mm -hmm. site. Because if you've got, if you're answering a problem for someone in Belfast, and you do it in a, in a differentiated and somewhat unique way, well, someone else has got that problem around the world, mm -hmm. and someone else is going to do that search on Google that night, and your website's going to come up, and then you're going to do it. So. I, I would say the barriers are, are, are way, way less and the opportunities are huge. The, then you have to get to how you do finance, contracts, all that sort of stuff, which you need to make sure you get good, proper advice on that. But I think there's huge opportunities. I, I, um, I mean, we were talking when we were setting up the interview and even just looking at Belfast today, you know, compared to 12 years ago when I first arrived here, this is a way more international city. You know, um, and and has moved on hugely with that. So, I I think you know there's very few cities that won't be affected by, again, not to get political globalization. There's winners and losers, mm -hmm. um, and you've got, you know, I suppose when I was reading some research. My last thing I'll say, read some research on this, and you know, it's really important to have an airport that connects to a hub. But that's the single most important thing. The good thing for Belfast, hopefully, it will keep it the Heathrow link because that is a matter, and it's not far from Dublin. You see, so you've got those two advantages. So, I think this is this is it's not difficult to do business from Northern Ireland. It's a small place. You can get to an airport reasonably quickly if you need yeah. to travel. But most business today, you probably don't even need to be physically mm -hmm. travelling. So, I think, I think it's it's more opportunities. So I think if you're a small business owner in in Northern Ireland today, 
you will be at one point doing international business, whether you like it or not. Yeah, I suppose that's what I'd say. You have to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just what you do. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you for no so much value today. Thank that you. was incredible. Okay. So if anyone wants to ask you any questions yeah. around yeah. international selling, yeah, international yeah, yeah, business, yeah. 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 trading, yeah. Is it okay if they reach out to you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Excellent. yeah. So, I mean, I'm always looking for new LinkedIn friends. I'm Brilliant. on Facebook, so that's where Excellent. I go. Um, yeah. So go to, go to LinkedIn. And yeah, so it's Robert Conlon, um, C-O-N-L-O-N. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm happy to ask any questions or link, reach out to me. Brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. So I can imagine there's going to be a few businesses okay. <laughs> talking to you okay. for that. No, Good. Again, thank you. And thank you for joining us today on this amazing inter interview and hopefully your international sales and training and business development uh, ideas and concepts have, have grown at no end because of that. Uh, we were coming live from the Innovation Factory today and we look forward to seeing you on the next video, which will hopefully be tomorrow. And my name is Kieran, I'm from Profile3, the content marketing team. Thank you.